Tonight, Senate Democrats finally turned to voting rights legislation, desperately renewing negotiations with Joe Manchin on a filibuster carve-out. But have they forgotten about the equally obstructionist kissed in cinema? I'll speak to a congressman who hopes to join that chamber next year, Representative Peter Welch. Also, the CDC reports that Omicron accounts for a sevenfold jump in the cases it's tested. What is the Biden administration doing to prepare for the coming surge? And will it be enough? Plus, it's no secret Donald Trump has cowed the Republican Party into submission, but he's also making them pay for the privilege. David K. Johnston joins me to discuss his new book on how the Trump family fleeced America and enriched themselves. Good evening. I'm Mehdi Hassan. It's been a banner year for the enemies of democracy, and their winning streak continues tonight. In 12 short months, the great American experiment has taken a physical pounding. It doesn't get more physical than weapons and fisticuffs in the halls of the United States Capitol. While the American flag took a literal beating out front, small-d democracy also took an ideological beating from conservative media outlets and the mouthpieces who appeared on them, who delivered a slow, deliberate drip, drip, drip of propaganda, as if January 6th was a mere blip. That, if it did happen, was the work of Antifa or angry tourists. Democracy also suffered a legal lashing, too, from Texas to Florida to Georgia to 19 states and counting so far that have signed off on at least 33 measures designed to make it harder for Americans to vote. That includes the state of Arizona, where in the spring, GOP Governor Doug Ducey intentionally made voting by mail a lot tougher. If you sit out two election cycles there, you're automatically removed from the list. But you know who knows about that already? Senator Kirsten Cinema. I mean, it's her state. Surely today, with a federal voting rights bill back on the table, she's ready to do anything within her power to preserve democracy back home in Arizona and across the land, right? Right? Sadly, Kirsten Cinema, this supposedly Democratic senator, is on the side of the enemies of democracy. As Republicans gut our voting system, our election rules, and push the big lie, Cinema does nothing. She remains completely, utterly, stubbornly unwilling to make even a one-time exception to the Senate's filibuster rule to preserve the absolute core of American freedom, voting rights. Here's Cinema's worn-out defense, offered through a spokesperson. She, quote, continues to support the Senate's 60-vote threshold to protect the country from radical reversals in policy. Senator Cinema has asked those who want to weaken the filibuster if it would be good for our country to do so, only to see the legislation rescinded in a few years and replaced by a nationwide voter ID law or similar restrictions. Her answer is, we shouldn't break the filibuster, because what if Republicans then do it too and make things worse? First off, does she really think Republicans need an excuse to dodge the filibuster to get what they want? Does she really think there are rules of engagement Republicans will follow? An honor system they won't dishonor? I mean, this is the same party that cried foul and blocked Obama's pick for the Supreme Court in February 2016. It's an election year, they cried. The election was nine months away. But they didn't blink before putting Amy Coney Barrett on the bench only weeks before the 2020 election. And then there's the reality that what she's warning might happen at a national level is already happening in states like hers, in Arizona. As Ari Berman from Mother Jones pointed out, Republicans state by state are making it harder to vote on simple majority party line votes. No filibuster to stop them there. But Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin say it's only right to have a bipartisan supermajority to protect voting rights. It's total asymmetric warfare, he says. And he's right. It appears some senators agree with that. Here's Democrat Maisie Hirono of Hawaii this morning on CNN. That's where he's at, and this is why if you have a 50-50 split Senate, you can have one person or two people just stop everything, and that is why people in our country should know that a 50-50 Senate sucks and we can't get things done. Nonetheless, the gridlock gaming, the pointless posturing, the pretend game of making progress 
continues on Capitol Hill. The president and vice president held a Zoom call today with top Senate Democrats, including Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who is poised to sideline the Build Back Better bill that we were discussing just last night and refocus on voting rights reform. But is it too little too late? Is this country, in small d democratic terms, now past the point of no return? An opinion piece in the New York Times suggests it, maybe. Author Thomas Edsel quotes a Cornell sociology professor, Michael Macy, who said an attempted coup would be less dangerous than the slow rise of authoritarian populism. Quote, if the water temperature increases only one degree per hour, it may take a while before you notice it's too hot. And Cornell government professor Suzanne Mettler wrote that the greatest danger to democracy is one of our two major parties, a party that helped protect democracy until recently, making it harder for people to recognize what's going on, she adds. Our political system in crisis is in crisis, and we should be shouting from the rooftops. I'm going to speak tonight to current congressman and Senate hopeful Peter Welch of Vermont to get his reaction to all this. But first, I'm joined by the people behind those ominous warnings. Michael Macy was also the lead author of Polarization and Tipping Point, a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And Suzanne Mettler co-authored Four Threats, The Recurring Crises of American Democracy. Uh, thank you both for joining me tonight. Uh, Suzanne, let me start with you. In your expert view, are we past the point of no return when it comes to American democracy, when it comes to preventing further extremism and polarization and backsliding? And if so, what comes next? Well, I don't think that we're past that point, but I think that we're in very dangerous straits. I think that uh, the situation we're in has been building for a long time. A lot of people thought it was just about Trump, but really the conditions that led us led to Trump had been developing for decades. And uh, it's things have only intensified once he was president. And since he left office, you know, you now have a situation where a majority of Republicans believe that Joe Biden is not the legitimate president, that Trump actually won. And, you know, there's no evidence to this. And yet this uh, belief continues to this day. And uh, despite the January 6th insurrection, the Republican Party leaders have not supported the investigation into what happened that day. And meanwhile, there are all of these efforts in the states to um, to scale not only scale back voting rights, but also to politicize election administration. And that's a real concern. And uh, that, that makes me very worried about the country going forward. Oh, yes. And Michael, a recent poll found that only 37 percent of Republicans have confidence in our election system, while 69 percent of Democrats do. It's an exact flip from 2019 when Democrats were highly skeptical and Republicans trusted the system. Is part of this simply that right wing media tells the big lie to Republican voters every day, while Biden and much of the mainstream media doesn't make clear that our democracy is on the line? They aren't making noise about this 24 seven. Well, the, it's always hard to know what the motivations are uh, behind people's responses on opinion polls. But uh, clearly, what we're seeing are divisions that run very deep. They, those divisions exist at all levels, including political elites as well as voters. But there are some important uh, changes that have happened in recent times that we talk about in our uh, paper that you mentioned on tipping points. And I think the important uh, point of that paper is the possibility that polarization could cross a tipping point beyond which it becomes increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to turn the temperature back down. Not impossible. Well, that's, I'll take that as some kind of good news. Uh, Michael, you're a sociology guy. How do you explain why Democrats are confident in a democratic system that very nearly failed entirely in 2020? Is their memory so short or what is going on? The warning signs are everywhere. It's like Alice in Wonderland level delusion. Well, I, I again, I, I hesitate to speculate on the motivations of people who respond to surveys. Uh, the thing to do is to have a follow-up survey to try to probe more deeply into the reasons for people's responses to questions like confidence in democratic institutions. 
But the, the, the fact that we are talking about this, the fact that we have opinion polls that ask people about this is indicative of the depth of the divisions that exist. Yes. And that's what concerns me and I think should concern all of us. Uh, why yes. are these divisions so deep? And how can the uh, how can we turn the temperature back down? And can we turn the temperature back down? Uh, those are the issues that we address in the paper. And I I think that we need to perhaps set aside the opportunity to score partisan points on either side and come together around the agenda item of do we need to both side do both sides need to back down? Do we need to put country first and party second? What does that mean, though, Mike? I mean, you say both sides need to back down. Let me bring in Susan. Uh, gubernatorial candidates running to be Republican nominee in Minnesota. They squared off uh, in a debate moderated by conservative host Hugh Hewitt this week. And they were asked point blank by the moderator, was Joe Biden legitimately elected president? Not a controversial question in a reality-based universe. Not a single one of the five could say yes. Where does that leave us, Suzanne, if the candidates, the Republican Party is putting forward are candidates like this? I mean, we have a two-party system. There's nowhere else to go. Here's the problem, is that to have any kind of diverse society and to have um, to, to avoid killing each other, if you have different points of view, we have to abide by some basic rules of the game. And these are the democratic rules of the game. And parties, party leaders, need to uphold them. So I'm talking about free and fair elections and electoral integrity, the rule of law, the legitimacy of the political opposition, and the integrity of rights. Um, all of this is much deeper and more fundamental than public policy conflicts. And um, you need to have leaders in both parties who will insist upon abiding by these basic rules of the game. The trouble is right now that one party um, that has historically defended those principles, the Republican Party, is not doing so. And yes. that's really troubling for going forward. It is indeed. Michael Macy, Suzanne Mettler, thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate your analysis. Can there be anything more frustrating for a member of the House than weathering grueling negotiation for months on end, passing bill after bill, only to have no say in the Senate where their bills go to die? Well, my next guest hopes to join that chamber next year. Democratic Congressman Peter Welch joins us after this short break. We've been talking about the erosion of democracy. Democrats and the Biden administration are now finally, finally turning their attention to voting legislation, or so they say. But it's all kind of a waste of time without a carve out to get around the damn filibuster, or ideally get rid of it altogether. But in this broken Senate, this 50-50 Senate, it's not just a lack of 10 decent or reasonable Republicans that's a problem. It's also Senators Manchin and Cinema on the Democratic side. So why would anyone want to be part of that upper chamber? Here with me now is Democratic Congressman Peter Welch, who's been in the House since 2007 representing Vermont and is now running for the Senate seat in that state. Congressman, thank you for coming on the show tonight. I have to ask, why do you even want to be in the Senate? It's such a clearly dysfunctional and many would argue anti-democratic body. Well, you know, I listened to your two guests and they are absolutely right democracy is in peril. So the question for any of us is not what we want to do, but what we must do. And for each of us, the answer to that depends on our circumstances. I'm in a position after serving in the House to win the Senate seat and then to be in that place where I'd like to get rid of the filibuster and I'd like to make it function because if we're going to protect democracy, if we're going to protect democracy, and that is in peril, then we have to have another senator who is going to stand up for that every chance he gets. Congressman, we seem to be at a crucial juncture, as you say, as the previous guest pointed out, when it comes to the American experiment. And yet Democrats in Congress and the White House don't seem to be taking this threat to our democracy seriously enough. And the proof of that is that your party has controlled the White House and both chambers of Congress for almost a year now and has not passed a single law to protect voting rights. That's a scandal, isn't it? You know, you're wrong about that. It's really bad for our democracy that we can't get that 49th and 50th vote in the Senate. But Biden is totally behind 
all these voting right uh, bills that we have, we've passed them in the House. The John Lewis Voting Right Protects Our, the Protect Our Democracy Act, uh, Fair Voting Act. We have done that. And we are now faced with the obstacle in the Senate of a 50-50 uh, division. And we've got a couple of senators who won't be willing to get rid of the filibuster. I would. But the ma vast majority of Democrats are absolutely in favor of all these things. So to blame all the Democrats when we've got the structural impediment, which is called the filibuster, we've got to solve the filibuster. And keep in mind, yes. if we vilify Democrats and we've got fight for failure, Mitch McConnell, fight every day, every single day for failure, who has done so much to erode democracy, then that is our adversary. And there's a role that the American people have to play in voting in people who are going to defend democracy. Congressman, Senate Democrats met today with President Biden and Vice President Harris on a path forward for voting rights legislation. Uh, but again, that likely can't happen without a filibuster carve out. You say that Joe Biden is totally behind these bills. The problem is we haven't seen him lead on filibuster reform. He's made a comment here and there. <coughs> this week, conservative Democratic senators like Mark Warner and John Hickenlooper said they would support, they would support a change, a carve out uh, for voting rights. Uh, Mansion cinema aren't budging. I just wonder, couldn't you have Joe Biden out front on the filibuster issue? I haven't seen him give a big speech saying, let's get rid of the filibuster, a big interview saying, get rid of the filibuster. How else do you put pressure on Mansion and cinema? How would you put pressure on Mansion and cinema if you were in the Senate with them? You know, here's the reality that Joe, Joe Manchin won in a state, West Virginia, that uh, he's a Democrat, as you know, and Trump won that by 30 points. So kind of. there's a practical problem that we have. How I would put pressure on him, I would try to talk to him. I would I would try to persuade. I'd try to say, Joe, look, what's at stake with the country? Look what's happening with the erosion of, of the right to vote in all these Republican Trump-led districts where they're literally stripping the sec independent secretaries of state to be able to certify an election and giving it to a partisan legislature. So the reality is, Every senator is an independent person who has an independent vote. So all the pressure in the world, at the end of the day, Joe Manchin, Kristen Sinema, they have to decide what they're going to do. And voters have a role in this as well, because the folks that really members of the House and members of the Senate listen to are the people they represent. On a different topic, Congressman, uh, earlier today we learned that the Senate parliamentarian, just before we came on air, ruled against the inclusion of immigration reform measures in the Build Back Better bill. Um, this comes on top of NBC reporting today that the Biden administration <coughs> is pulling out of negotiations to compensate families who were separated at the border, who had their children, children taken from them under the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy. The ACLU, whose lawyers are representing these families, uh, said today there's no explanation for not settling these cases other than the Biden administration is unwilling to use literally any political capital to help Help the young children deliberately abused by our government. What is your reaction to these latest developments on the immigration front? And isn't it shameful that we can't give $450,000 to the families of kids who we basically tortured? Well, I went to the border with, Sen uh, uh, with Senator Merkley, and it was appalling. And the courts are the place where that is going to be decided. And the Senate parliamentarian, th this is truly weird, and it's a function of the filibuster. We have to have a seance with a senator who's been dead for over a decade as to whether or not some public policy legislation is permitted under his bizarre rule that had nothing to do with immigration or anything else. And that is all a function of the iron grip that the filibuster has on the capacity of the Senate to make an up or down vote by majority rule, which is the democratic process on what should be our immigration policy. It's really a reason why the filibuster is totally inappropriate, because it's not about protecting minority rights. It's allowing minority rule. And that is wrong. The filibuster is totally inappropriate because it's allowing minority rule. I totally agree with you, Congressman. I just wish I could hear the president say those words. Uh, Congressman Peter Welch, thank you so much for your time tonight. When we come back, the variant that stole Christmas break Look, I'm not naive enough to think we defeated COVID or that we may ever defeat COVID, not with certain people's attitudes. But am I the only one who's had that sense of deja vu lately? Doesn't it feel like we're back to where we began? More on that on the other side of this break with some real experts. We're unvaccinated. 
We are looking at a winter of severe illness and death for unvaccinated. This was the Christmas when everything was supposed to be different. But the speed at which the Omicron variant is overwhelming parts of the U.S., as the Delta variant is still a thing. Yeah, remember Delta? Has many Americans rethinking their holiday plans. Right now, cases are climbing fast in Rhode Island, as parts of the Northeast and the Midwest are seeing cases explode at an alarming rate. Experts say the new variant has all the makings of a massive wave because it could be substantially more contagious than what came before. And to see where we might be going, just look at South Africa, where the Omicron variant was initially identified. Cases are on a steady incline. But we don't even have to go that far, to be honest. This is the graph of cases at Cornell University in upstate New York. More than 900 new COVID cases were reported over the past week, pushing the university to shut down parts of its campus and move final exams online. On this show, we have praised President Joe Biden for all he's done with the rollout of vaccines. It's been a relief in a global pandemic to have an administration that doesn't tell you to inject disinfectant into your arms, doesn't refuse to wear masks, doesn't at every turn reject basic science. But as we prepare for another crisis, is the Biden administration doing enough? Because it's not enough just to be not Trump. Take testing, for example. This video is from an NBC Miami station showing the line for a drive through testing site. And no, this is not from March or April 2020. It's from today. And the Department of Health and Human Services warns that the nation's supply of COVID tests could be overstretched as Omicron hits and Christmas travel begins. I'm sorry, but almost two years into this pandemic and almost a year into the Biden presidency, and as thousands of Americans continue to die from COVID every week, that is just not good enough. Here to discuss more on where we go from here is epidemiologist and immunologist Dr. Michael Mina, formerly of Harvard University and now chief science officer for EMED, and Dr. Nahid Bedelia. She's an infectious disease expert and professor at Boston University School of Medicine. Thank you both for coming back on the show. Uh, Michael, let me start with you. Are we ready for the kind of mass testing we're going to need in the coming weeks? Isn't it shameful that more than a year and a half into this pandemic and a year into a non-Trump administration, we still haven't sorted out testing? I went to get tested yesterday. It was a two-hour wait in a drive through That is ridiculous. It shouldn't be that hard. And yet you have the White House press secretary saying this to a question on why we can't get rapid tests to people much more easier than we do now. Have a listen. Why not just make them free and give them out to, and have them available everywhere? Should we just send one to every American? Maybe. Then, then, what, ha then what happens if, you, if every American has one test? How much does that cost? And then what happens after that? Michael, I know you were as furious as I was about that answer. That is mad, right? The Germans and Brits do send one to every home. That's exactly right. These tests are public health tools that are absolutely essential. They are not expensive to produce. This is the cost that she referenced is is ridiculous. The the entirety of the United States could be testing mm. themselves on a frequent basis for a year for less than 1% of what this virus has thus far cost the United States. So cost of the tests is a ridiculous excuse. We just haven't uh, taken the initiative as a nation to actually roll out the important public health tools that we need to benefit and best support the vaccine rollout. Nahid, you and I have had multiple conversations on this show over the course of this pandemic. How bad is it right now? What is coming down the line in terms of Omicron in the US? And how badly is this administration handling it in terms of not ramping up testing, not being more aggressive on mask and vaccine mandates? I mean, we still don't have a vaccine mandate for domestic travel barely a week from Christmas Eve. Yeah, Mitty, I, I think the worry that I and others have right now is that we are entering a phase of a twin pandemic because what you've seen in UK, you know, secondary countries outside of South Africa that first saw that growth is just a doubling time that's unbelievable. I mean, the, the pandemic is just moving so fast. And even the numbers that you're hearing about the prevalence of Omicron are probably underestimating how much of it there is in this country because, you know, academic labs are also doing these testing on smaller samples and are reporting much higher numbers, you know, because they're able to turn it around more quickly. It's likely where the surge of Omicron is already well underway. And if the doubling time is what we're seeing in UK, the concern here is that if it's a much more transmissible variant, then it infects many more people. And, and even if a smaller percentage of them end up now getting hospitalized because so many more of us have been vaccinated, 
because it's such a big number of people who might get infected, the absolute number of people who might get hospitalized is still going to be large. And that's why we're concerned, because that virus is still going to find people who are unvaccinated and people who are vaccinated and vulnerable. And, that, and that's the concern. And so the testing becomes, as Michael said, so important in this situation. So, Michael, just coming back to testing and rapid tests, which is your expertise, and you now work for a, a rapid testing company, uh, explain to our viewers exactly how a rapid test works and why you've been so evangelical about them, because a lot of people think they're not that reliable. Uh, so walk us through it. Let's say you're having a holiday dinner at your house. You've invited friends and family. Some will possibly stay the night. When should they test? How often should they test? How accurate will that test result be? Yeah, so the, the great benefit of a rapid test is in its name, it's rapid. It gives you immediate results. It doesn't require you to wait a day or two or many times more for that result. The tests are very, very accurate to detect you when you are infectious and you have a lot of virus. These are the times when you want to be detected so that you can take immediate action and you can self-isolate. If you're having a winter gathering or, or a Christmas uh, party, for example, one of the best tools and best approaches you can take to be able to keep that, uh, that gathering safe is use a rapid test as soon before the gathering as possible and have all of the people joining use one as soon before the gathering as possible. Not a day before, not 72 hours before, in the hour before, 10 minutes in when you're sitting in the driveway, just use the test. You can do it. They're very simple tests. And, uh, and if everyone in the party does that, then it's a very, very, very unlikely that there's going to be somebody spreading a lot of virus in that gathering, and it will greatly reduce risk to everyone. Now, the big question everyone is asking is, do the vaccines work against Omicron? According to a new study, all three vaccines uh, appear to be significantly less protective against the Omicron variant, but a booster dose likely restores most of the protection. Is it too crude to say now that three doses is the new two doses and that two doses doesn't really protect you against infection? I've read the South African study that says, I believe, 33 percent effective only against preventing infection. Yeah, I think it depends on what the outcome is that you're looking at. You know, I think that you could still say that two doses will give you significant protection against severe disease because studies have also coming come out looking at the T cell side of our immune response, which really helps determine some of the protection against severe disease. And that doesn't seem to be as affected. But, you know, having said that, I would encourage everybody to get a booster because the data is clear. The booster helps restore some of the protection against infection, and it's most certainly also increases your protection against severe disease and hospitalizations. What I don't want people to do is hear the fact that vaccines are affected by these, you know, percentages, small percentages against severe disease and decide, well, why should I get a vaccine? Because I can tell you the yes. most vulnerable people right now in this wave, this Omicron second wave on top of the Delta wave are still people who are unvaccinated. Um, and people who might have had maybe just had got a prior infection and have not gotten vaccinated at all after that, I would encourage those people to also seek out and get vaccinated. That's really going to ramp up their immune system in time for Omicron. Some troubling times ahead, but appreciate your analysis, advice and guidance. Both of you, Dr. Bedelia, Dr. Mina, thank you so much for your time tonight. Coming up next, voting irregularities during the 2020 presidential election. And I don't know about you, but when I think irregular, I think of the state of Florida. I'll explain why. That story is next. You do want to stick around for it. Florida. What would we do without the state of Florida? Providing us all with a seemingly endless supply of oranges, weird roadside attractions, and voter fraud crackdowns. In 2012, former GOP Governor Rick Scott tried to scare off Latino voters by using registration data to fish for non-citizen immigrants. Then, two years later, GOP officials tried to gerrymander the state by secretly submitting a bright red congressional map under a fake name. And don't even get me started on current GOP Governor Ron DeSantis. After Floridians restored voting rights to felons in 2018, DeSantis and his Republican friends said, not so fast. In the spirit of the Jim Crow era poll tax, they enacted a new law requiring felons to pay all legal financial obligations before being able to vote. And of course, who could forget DeSantis mock signing one of the country's most restrictive voting bills live on Fox and Friends 
earlier this year. The new law limits ballot drop box locations, restricts who can drop off a voter's ballot and gives new powers to partisan poll watchers, all in the name of stopping so-called voter fraud. So good news tonight. The governor has been validated. Three voters in the villages have been charged with voter fraud. The rub, they're not Democrats. Those three residents of the now infamous Trump-loving retirement community in Florida are accused of casting more than one ballot in the 2020 election. But two of the suspects are registered Republicans. The third is unaffiliated. So when finally confronted with real cases of voter fraud in their state, surely Ron DeSantis and his Florida GOP pals were outraged and rushed onto Fox News with plenty of election integrity soundbites. Let's play them now. Oh, wait. We don't have any, because Governor DeSantis was too busy rolling out his Stop Woke Act. Oh, that's its real name, I promise you, and you can imagine what it tries to address. So it does kind of seem like when the voter fraud is allegedly perpetrated by Republicans, these Republican officials have no interest in talking about it, let alone stopping it. It's almost as if the voting restrictions they put in place are really just ways of squeezing black and brown voters out of the democratic process. Kind of like that long reptile that squeezes the life out of its prey. What is that called again? Ron, can you help me out? Invasive Burmese pythons, which can grow to 20 feet in length, weigh up to 200 pounds, and cause major damage to the ecosystem. I mean, they, these, these things will eat everything. And we spend all this money and we want to do all this stuff to restore, but yet if they're just uh, running roughshod over all the other species, um, you know, th that's not what we want running roughshod over everything. You said it, Ron. You said it. That's definitely not what we want. When we return, how long did it take Donald Trump to turn the White House into one of his biggest grifts ever? According to a new book, just 40 minutes after taking the oath of office, apparently, I talked to the award-winning journalist and author behind the fascinating story next. Day in and day out on this show, we've been talking about how the rise of Donald Trump has changed America for the worse, the hacking away at our very democracy, the incitement of far-right white supremacist groups, the big lie that attempted to overturn our legitimate election results. They're all stories centered on Trump's desire for power. But what often gets lost in all these conversations is, quite simply, the money. To many, Trump is no doubt someone who epitomizes what it looks like when narcissism, racism and authoritarianism as well as sheer paranoia and insecurity, are the driving forces behind someone's politics. But he's also a businessman, driven by money, profits, and a love of filing for bankruptcies to get out of his cycles of debt. And not only did he find ways to make his presidency a very financially profitable one for himself, the fact that the money's still coming in droves suggests he's not going anywhere. The Washington Post identified at least 30 GOP events at Trump-owned properties this year, more than ever before from large receptions that have raised a million dollars for GOP campaigns to seats at a Mar-a-Lago dinner with Donald going for $250,000 a head. In fact, The Post found that his properties collected almost half a million dollars from just nine events. Remember, this is on top of what Trump profited while he was in office. I mean, he made close to $1.5 in income just from one online retail store, according to financial disclosures reviewed by CNBC. But Trump didn't turn the highest office in the land into a cash cow on his own. The Trump clan was also part of this. And the grand scope of this for-profit presidency is what a new book by a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter lays out. The Big Cheat, how Donald Trump fleeced America and enriched himself and his family by the award-winning Trump family expert David K. Johnston tells the disturbing and sprawling story of just how much the Trump family's extravagant lifestyle and pure open greed cost the American taxpayer. David K. Johnston joins me now to discuss some of the highlights of the big cheat. He's also the author of the 2016 book, The Making of Donald Trump, and the founder of DCReport.org. David, thanks so much for coming back on the show. You write in the book that there are events lost in the torrent of bad behavior that was the Trump presidency. I know I feel that way. It's so hard to keep track of everything that happened during the Trump years, and we're still living in its shadow. 
But what was the most shocking financial story, in your view, related to the 45th president and or his kids? What would you offer to a Trump supporter as the best proof of their hero's grift and corruption? Well, that Donald Trump attacked our ally in the Middle East, Qatar, where we have our most important military base, after the Qataris declined to make an $800 million loan to Jared Kushner to bail him out of a terrible real estate investment. Uh, Donald then took up the side of the Saudis and the Emiratis against the Qataris. Uh, there's a lot of enmity between them. And uh, Jared Kushner got bailed out by the other two countries, people in those countries. Uh, you know, this was submarining American national security to rescue the first son-in-law and daughter, first daughter, from a disastrous error in their business practice. Yes, and right now there's a lot of talk of Jared Kushner uh, wandering around the Middle East in the post-presidency trying to drum up more business and contacts and money. Full disclosure, I should point out, I used to work for Al Jazeera English, which is owned by Qatar. Uh, right so now, there's a, laundry, there's a laundry list of investigations, David, going on, looking into Trump and his business dealings, insurance fraud, tax evasion, civil fraud, election interference, etc. And this week, a federal judge dismissed a lawsuit by Trump that was trying to block Congress from getting his tax returns. Trump's probably going to file an appeal. Now, you know him, you know his family better than most people. You know, it's tax returns, some of them. Uh, you know how he's gotten away with a lot of this stuff. Will history repeat itself? Will he survive again? I, I think Donald will definitely be indicted by the grand jury in Manhattan. I don't expect it to be a tax charge uh, because that can be very complicated. It'll be a New York State racketeering enterprise charge. And I don't describe Donald as a businessman. He's a con artist and a racketeer who poses as a businessman, but his real yes. business is taking money from you that he's not entitled to through lies, contracts, false promises, refusals to pay, and on and on and on. Yeah. David, I have lots more to talk to you about, including Ivanka and Don Jr. Stick around. We're going to come back and continue this conversation after a short break. Welcome back. We've been talking about how much Donald Trump profited financially from his first term in office and how he's still making money from it. But the thing is, he didn't profit from a business turned presidency or presidency turned business all by himself. His family came along for the ride. Still here with me is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist David K. Johnston, who's written a book about all this. David, welcome back to the show. You tell us in your new book, The Big Cheat, that topping the list of who got richer while Trump was in office was Ivanka Trump and her husband, Jared Kushner. Uh, they walked out having made at least $172 million from outside activities, possibly as much as $640 million. Jared also set up a holding company in a Caribbean tax haven. No Trump appointments better illustrate the potential for America becoming a kleptocracy than the influence that Jared and Ivanka wielded in the Trump White House. I mean, wow. It's crazy to me that that was all legal, too. Uh, yes. Well, one of the things Donald has exposed is not only do we have weak white-collar crime laws in America, which has don allowed Donald to be a successful criminal his entire life, but we have always assumed the president would act as if the office is a public trust, which it is. Uh, none of our rules assume that someone would come in and say, oh, this is all for me. I'm going to be dictator for life. I can make money any way I want. Or as Donald put it, I have an article, too, that says I can do anything I want, which is yes. not what our Constitution says. And on Ivanka, David, Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, who's been held in criminal contempt of Congress, is out with a book. And he says that Donald Trump's infamous Bible photo op at Lafayette Square in the middle of all those protests was actually Ivanka's idea. According to the book, she thought the photo shoot would signal law and order would prevail to people of faith. I mean, if we take Meadows' word for it, this couldn't have been worse advice. She's not the sharpest tool in the box, is she? No, she's certainly not. None of them particularly are. And their father is a man who, uh, it's surprising he held up a Bible. He wrote six pages in one of his books, denigrating Christians, calling them fools, idiots, schmucks. And he openly and often rejects the message of the New Testament because he says his life philosophy is revenge, which is aggressively anti-Christian. So we talked about how uh, 
None of them particularly are bright. But earlier this week, Congresswoman Liz Cheney read aloud text messages sent to Mark Meadows during the insurrection, and they included texts from Trump's own son, Donald Trump Jr., begging Meadows to help stop the Capitol attack, saying things like, we need an oval address. It's gotten out of hand. He's got to condemn this ASAP. Did you know uh, Donald Trump Jr. was the brighter of the two Donald Trumps? Um... Perhaps. I think what the message shows is that he's afraid of daddy. He didn't go to daddy and say, dad, you got to no. stop this. Uh, and it also shows that he understood perfectly well what the Republicans are denying. Donald Trump was behind this effort to overthrow the government, and it didn't start in 2016. I said in 2015, if Donald Trump got in the White House, he would never leave peacefully. There were journalists who said they thought I was way out there. Turned yeah. out I was right about that. And Donald has been working on trying to subvert our democracy and stay there. Clear back to the 2016 election when he took a meeting with Kremlin agents, or his son Don Jr. took it. And let's remember what the opening words of the Mueller report were. The Russian government, in a sweeping and aggressive fashion, interfered extensively in the 2016 election. That's a paraphrase. Yeah. So... <laughs> You're right to uh, bring up some of his past. I mean, I'm also intrigued by the fact that he did have to text Mark Meadows. He couldn't, te he couldn't text his own father, uh, which tells right. us a lot about the relationship between Donald Trump Sr. and Jr. Um, David K. Johnston, we'll have to leave it there. The book is The Big Cheat, How Donald Trump Fleeced America and Enriched Himself and His Family. Thank you so much for your time. Another day. Another Islamophobic remark from a member of Congress, the latest in this tiring saga that sees no consequences. That's next. It seems to be open season on Muslims from the Republican Party right now. Last night, I told you about the Islamophobic comments that Pennsylvania Republican Congressman Scott Perry made on the House floor while he was debating a bill to fight Islamophobia. Perry aimed those comments at his Democratic colleague from Minnesota, Ilhan Omar, one of two Muslim women in the House, ludicrously claiming she was linked to al-Qaeda. Earlier this month, we also talked on this show about similar attacks on Omar from Republicans Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, in which they called her a member of the Jihad Squad and worse. But in all that coverage, everyone seemed to overlook ridiculously Islamophobic comments from Arizona Republican Paul Gosar. You remember him, the same congressman who last month was censured and stripped of committee assignments for posting a video that depicted him killing his Democratic colleague, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. That Paul Gosar last week called for the removal of Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque, Islam's third holiest site. Here's what Gosar said. The United Nations should be finding ways to dismantle and move that mosque, which is an affront to all religions. The land where the mosque stands is also a holy site for Jews, who refer to it as the Temple Mount. And there's a debate at the UN over how it should be addressed. But not even the right-wing prime minister of Israel is calling for the destruction of the mosque itself. It's bonkers. And while Gosar wants us to think from his statement that he is standing up for Jews worldwide, don't forget what he said after the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017, where far-right demonstrators chanted, Jews will not replace us. Gosar said the event was a false flag from the left, funded by Jewish billionaire George Soros. So what is going on here in this latest episode of Islamophobic nonsense from a Republican who's also accused of anti-Semitism? Let's bring in Wajahat Ali and Lara Friedman. Wajahat is a columnist for the Daily Beast. His book, Go Back to Where You Came From and Other Helpful Recommendations on How to Become American, is out in January. Lara is president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Thank you both for joining me tonight. We don't have much time. I'm going to get straight into it. Wajahat, I'm pretty sure if that a member of the squad had put out a statement calling for the dismantling of a Jewish holy site or even a Christian one, politicians of both parties, the media across the board, would be all over it. But with Gosar... It's radio silence. I think this show is the only part of the U.S. media that has or is covering his outrageous statement. It hasn't even been mainstream news. I mean, this is such an extremist statement that, like you said, even the right-wingers in Israel would never say this because they realize it would cause mass destruction and violence. Paul Gosar is also the man, let's not forget, who openly spoke at Nick Fuentes' white supremacist rally. Nick Fuentes is a notorious anti-Semite who makes Holocaust jokes. 
Paul Gosar is also the one who did a violent anime cartoon against AOC. Instead of condemning yes. him, the GOP leadership praised him. So this is now condoned. It's mainstreamed. And because there's lack of outrage, Mehdi, it is normalized. Anti-Semitism and Islamophobia is normalized, and it is the fuel of yes. white supremacy and white supremacist conspiracy theories that Gosar believes like the replacement theory. Laura, Gosar's attack on Al-Aqsa um, is done, he says, in defense of Jewish holy sites. But Gosar himself is, of course, as Wajat just mentioned, associated with white supremacists. He said crazy racist things about George Soros, gone to conferences attended by Holocaust deniers. It feels like he's doing this classic far-right thing of trying to ward off charges of anti-Semitism by both being as pro-Israel or pro-right-wing Israelis as possible, while also trying to pit Jews against Muslims. I think that's absolutely true. Um, but I think there's another piece of it that maybe is being overlooked. And I, I don't know if the folks have seen, there was another statement tonight on Twitter from a, a pastor who is known as Trump's top pastor, uh, joining and doubling down on Representative Gosar's statements. And he specifies this is about scripture. As much mm. as Gosar says it's about standing up for Jewish rights, in Jerusalem, the language he is using is effectively quoting Matthew 24, 14. Yes, I looked it up, which talks about the mosques on the site and calls them an abomination. This is really a call not to protect Jewish equities in Jerusalem, but it's playing to the apocalyptic end time folks who believe that part of the second coming of Christ requires the building of the temple, which requires the destruction of the mosques. And in that sense, it's, I think, even more inflammatory and more terrifying. Yes, definitely inflammatory, definitely terrifying. Why, you wrote a recent piece for the Daily Beast headlined, We Know Republicans Hate Muslims. Do Democrats Care? Uh, for those of our viewers who haven't read it yet, what's your answer to that question? Do Democrats care? I still think Islamophobia is the last refuge of all bigots, regardless of partisanship. And as you started your show, you know, if Ilhan Omar had done X, Y, and Z, we always like to use that as a double standard to see what would happen. Because I cannot imagine that Ilhan Omar would get away. Forget like forget the Republicans. Democrats would throw her under the bus. Chuck Schumer threw her under the bus, right? She's The squad is routinely thrown under the bus. And we saw that Nancy Pelosi has relented in, cause, in asking for, if you will, the stripping of the committees of Lauren Bobart. She's punted it to Kevin McCarthy, says, oh, we can't take care of all their messes. Well, we've seen what the Republican leadership does. It condones it. It praises it. It tolerates it. And so the message to the rest of us Muslims is, if they come after Ilhan Omar, a black woman who wears a job, who's a practicing Muslim and a refugee, what does it say about the rest of us, our daughters, our children, right, our moms? Will the Democrats have our back? And right now it seems like, yeah, they'll pass something condemning Islamophobia, but when it really comes push to shove, they will not strip yep. Bobart of her committees. And you better believe Republicans would have done that times 10. Laura, last word to you, what, minute left. What can Democrats, what can liberals do to push back against Islamophobia as it's mainstreamed by the GOP, especially by anti-Semitic types? Look, it's for all people, Democrats, Republicans. If you care about your fellow Americans, if you care about free speech, if you care about free practice of religion, if you care about what's right in the world, then you defend against these things. And I want to be clear, what that is talking about, and you're talking about Republicans, Representative Gottheimer, on the same anti-Islamophobia anti resolution or bill offered an amendment that effectively bought into an Islamophobic trope. His amendment that he wanted to introduce on the floor suggests that you can't trust Muslims to monitor Islamophobia because they'll use that to, to carry their anti-American, anti-Israel, other agenda, secret agenda. It's straight up Islamophobia, no. and that's from Dem. You're right. Both of you are right to point out that, sadly, it is uh, it can be bipartisan bigotry. Uh, Wajat Ali and Lara Friedman, appreciate you taking time out tonight. We'll have to leave it there. Some breaking news before we go tonight. A federal judge in Manhattan on Thursday overturned a nearly $4.5 billion settlement between the maker of OxyContin and the family that owns the company under this ruling. Members of the Sackler family, remember them, would no longer be protected from new civil lawsuits. Judge Colleen McMahon said that the original shield for the family was not authorized under the bankruptcy code. Some bad news for the Sacklers tonight, which sounds like good news to me. That does it for the Mehdi Hassan show for this week. Eamon Moyuddin is in the chair tomorrow night here on Peacock. And as always, join us anytime on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok. For now, from me, good night.
Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.